Hello, hello world. How's everybody doing? Yeah, this is our first podcast. I guess we could do a little introduction, you know, some introductions, I guess, if you want. I don't know, David, if you want to go um, introduce yourself. Oh, God. Okay, let's see. Um, hello, people. My name is David. Uh, I am, I guess I'm technically still currently unemployed. So, but um, <laughs> I am a to be consultant. Don't ask me what that means. I have no <laughs> idea what it is. Um, I just know that it's what you do when you sell out of academia and just decide to make banks. So uh, yeah, other than that, uh, graduated uh, bachelor's political science. Uh, I like political psychology. It's interesting to see how people think when it comes to politics. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Adam, is there anything else that's important? What do you, what, what oh, do you think? Oh, you know, I, there might be one thing that's probably a little important. <laughs> like where you graduated oh, from, maybe. <laughs> listen, okay. Uh, no, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I am the smartest person who has ever lived. Um, <laughs> absolute genius. Like, like future generations, I will be the giant whose shoulders they are standing upon, right? But I don't want... Uh, if they find out that I went to Harvard, they're going to think everybody from Harvard is this smart. And oh my God, trust me, they're not. Trust me, they're not. You're dumb. Especially, I am the outlier. I can believe that you're an outlier for sure. Um, especially if, with... If anything, so, I'm just... Oh, sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, just especially with some of the stories you shared about your time there. But, go, you know, go ahead. Okay, yeah. If, if that's important, yeah, I graduated from Harvard, but... Um, Anybody who's listening who thinks that that's a big deal, unironically, uh, man, people who go to people from Harvard are not what you'd think, especially the soft sciences and the humanities. I'm sure the biology department at Harvard is amazing. I mean, I went out with a biology professor at Harvard and she was pretty amazing, but I'll leave it at that, though. I'm sure she doesn't want to get docs on my podcast. Uh, uh -huh, of course. Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, yeah, my name's Adam. Uh, I'm a clinical psychology student still, and I work in like continuing ed, basically, which is like not at all what I want to be doing. But I have a lot of interest in like literature, myth, uh, psychology, personal uh, personality, psychology, existential psychology, um, it, just a lot of interesting things there. I've read a lot of books uh, just, you know, uh, personally and, you know, the biggest impediment for me in education, I would probably be in academia, although I'm pretty jaded because I work in higher ed at the moment. And it's, you know, it's just been a tragic experience, I'll say, just with school administration, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, but, but I, you know, I think I'd like to do research or rather even perform uh, like existential therapy, um, like in, in sort of a, um, clinical environment, because um, I, I just think that there's a lot of value in that. And so I spend a lot of time reading about that. Um, a lot of psychologists like Rollo May, Irv Ulom, Eric Fromm, et cetera. And I just have a lot of like personal interest in those types of areas. And me and David have been friends since uh, since we were five years old, I think. And so we've kind of, we have a lot of the first same, grade, similar interests. First, first grade, yeah. First grade, yeah. And so we, we've got a lot of friend, you know, a lot of interests that overlap now, ironically. His are more political than mine, um, but, I think that there's still a lot of like a lot of overlap um, in the way that like we we view the world and the way that we like to analyze, uh, you know, current events and different things like that. So, um, yeah, I just think it'd be good. You know, we're just planning to talk about different, you know, different uh, uh, different features of, you know, the social sciences, different, you know, current events, maybe different, just different concepts that we find interesting from our reading. Uh, you know, I think that you know, we don't have like a strong set agenda or whatever for what we're going to talk about, you know, in the future. But, you know, I think today I know David, you had something you wanted to chat about evolutionary psychology and the shadow, the Jungian shadow, maybe. Yeah. And that is definitely, yeah. If you want to talk about that, I totally would like to, mm -hmm. I would, before we do that, I, there would totally have to be a caveat that I would mm -hmm. definitely want to give though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Social sciences in general and talking about evolutionary psychology specifically, because, uh, man, those are those could be some dangerous waters we'd be mm -hmm. we'd be mm -hmm. getting into if we don't yeah. caveat. But yeah, it's up to you if you want to start talking about that now. Sure. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and we can kind of uh, I mean, we, we can kind of talk about the, the pitfalls of social psychology even before we get into Evo psych before we even kind of get into it, because I know that there's a lot of like charlatans online that like use evo psych like especially like red pill folks and like other sort of like bad actors that 
really co-opt what is like an actual field of psych, uh, field of psychology for like weird, uh, like sort of just sort of weird conclusions or to sort of like perpetuate stereotypes or to like use it in, 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 as argumentation for like just just bad morally evil things, I'd say. Um, same oh, thing yeah. for like yeah. most of, like there's a large swath of social psych uh, of the social sciences that are just um, uh, just not very rigorous and like they get a bad rap and like they do partly deserve the bad rap um, just because of their their history. But it's sort of like, you know, not all the apples are bad. Not every research paper that comes out of the social sciences is poorly formulated. You know, it doesn't not everything has bad methodology, not everything, you know, engages in P hacking or false stats or whatever. But like, uh, you know, it is important, like you can kind of draw any conclusions that you want when you look at the social sciences, you know, you can, that there's like some old saying, which I generally hate because it's partly true and mostly false, which is that you could find a study to support anything. It's usually used by folks that are like bad actors. Again, that like, uh, you know, I don't need to trust vaccines. I just, you know, there's, there's a study for everything. You know, I could find a study that, that shows that, you know, cutting my toenails causes cancer or whatever. And it's like, maybe you can, but like the effect size is like 0.0000001 or something like that, you know, and it's like totally not relevant at all. And so, yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of social, a lot of the social sciences are like that in that way. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but obviously, obviously not all, and it's still interesting to explore. So like everything that we talk about here is just interesting, basically. I don't know that there's necessarily like serious societal ramifications for like discussing how Evo Psych engages with the shadow, but it is, it's like interesting. It kind of like can provide a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about it, a new way of like conceptualizing the way people engage uh, with, with their shadow. They're the, basically the, like um, the sort of I don't know. I mean, do you have do you have more to add to that or is, uh, other insights about the social sciences and whatnot? Uh, basically, the for the social sciences, I would say that basically I think the best way that I feel I can put it is the problem. This is something that I think the right gets wrong when if they were a little bit better, they could really make a good criticism of the social science. The problem isn't that it's all fake. The problem is that it's unreliable and it's very difficult to figure out what is the good and what is the bad uh especially if you're an outsider who doesn't know how to figure out what's good and bad if that makes sense mm -hmm. it's like a, it's like a car almost it's like a, you know you unless you know how to look at a car and analyze a car when you're buying a used car you might get a lemon mm -hmm. and even if you know about cars you can still get a lemon. yeah and it's that's kind of what the social sciences are there's a lot of lemons yeah yeah or like a biblical example might be like a wheat from the chaff, you know, like whenever you were threshing wheat, you would throw the wheat up in the air and all the bad wheat would fall to the ground and all the, or, or, all the good wheat would fall to the ground and all the dust and particulates would fly off in the wind. Basically, it's, it's sort of like, it's basically like that. There, there's just, there's a lot of chaff. There's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of like bad stuff. And, and unfortunately, a lot of it can be kind of confusing or hidden or, yeah, or you fall prey to the you know, the headline fallacy, I guess, where it's just like, you just read the headline in the abstract oh, of a study oh, yeah. and, or even worse, you read an article, the headline of an article that's reporting that a study was just released. Um, and you run with that when like nine times out of 10, like the headline is sensationalizing like one word of the abstract of the study. Um, and so you, you're really not getting like the, the essence of what, the authors and even the authors of that study might even push back against the article, depending on what it is. Obviously, like some of them seem to not care too much, but but generally I feel oh, like, yeah. you yeah. know, I don't like to assume that people are like maliciously trying to misrepresent their studies or their work or their research or whatever. Um, and like when things get heavily publicized, obviously like uh, ideologues and like, you know, people of one side or the other are going to emphasize different aspects of it. You know, like if you found a study about, I don't know, having a flag in your front yard and it was shown that like it made the lawn in your grass produce 10% fewer allergens or whatever. It's like, you know, you can imagine like there are the pro Patriot side that wants you to raise flags and they'll be, you know, going on about how great, you know, being patriotic is it's like lowering your chance of seasonal allergies and whatever. And then, you know, the other 
anti-patriotism side might argue against and say something like, um, uh, you're causing environmental damage. The lower allergens is really uh, a sign that bees aren't pollinating your lawn or something like that. I don't know. You could put a spin on anything basically, but oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I would probably say to that study? Mm. I would say, you know what? That sounds like a spurious cor correlation because I know conservatives are more conscientious and they probably just mow their lawn more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just a proxy for, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'd be like, how do you know that? Did, did you check? Did you did do your methods account for something like that happening? Mm -hmm. hey, yeah. granted, they might not even say. They might just say, "Oh, this was just a correlation." As mm -hmm. long as they, you know. But yeah, that that type of over extrapolation is very, very, very common. Mm -hmm. Even if the paper technically hedges. Yeah. There could be a lot of over extrapolation. Yeah, of but course. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, then in the reality then, that the reality of that situation is that like the ten percent allergen thing is listed in like uh, like the footnotes under complications with the study. Appendix, that's yeah, yeah like <laughs> uh, table two four. Uh, yeah. If you look about halfway down the chart on the third to the right, I have, dude, I've seen papers that literally hide virtually all of their statistics. They're like very, very, very important statistics. In an appendix that you have to download separ separately as a supplement to the PDF. Yeah, I've been and and that's not a, always bad, but it was some really bad stats. And I'm like, okay, I know what you guys are doing. Yeah, I know yeah. what that's there. Yeah. Okay. With it, and then one thing I'd say with like the Evo Psych stuff, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to a lot of uh, the softer sciences, uh, different areas have different things that they're really good at and they're really bad at. I would say that Evo Psych, it does get a bad rep that sometimes isn't earned uh, for having not great methods. And that's pretty true. The methods aren't very good a lot of the times. A lot of times it, it really just is, hey, let's like see if the world kind of looks like how we would expect if this thing was true. But mm -hmm. you can't do more than that. But the thing that I think makes up for it is very good theoretical foundations. It really just is the idea that um evolution impacts our psychology which i i think is just really hard to deny that right and it's really just more of a debate about how mm -hmm. and then the other thing i would say is just on them a lot of things look really good on paper you have a really good story you could point to studies to back it up that doesn't mean your theory is true the theory that i'm going to put out here i'm not saying it's true i believe that this is probably pretty accurate but nobody should take my my word for it. I would anybody who does is make a big mistake. And then the last one is just when it comes to moral extrapolations, uh, de the kind of like red pill deterministic view of all this stuff is normally pretty poorly informed by the research itself. It doesn't map on very well to many theories. Um, and then even where they might be correct about making like a generalized statement that like oh you know, I don't know, testosterone has this effect, which means that men are more likely to be, like, aggressive or whatever. Um, you're not really going to get a lot of, like, moral claims you can make explicitly, like, explicitly from that. You know what I mean? Like, right. you can't derive an ought from it is. Right. So, yeah, do you think we've properly hedged? I, I think so. We've hedged for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. I think, I think we've done enough hedging, I'd say. Okay. Well, let's see. Oh, shit. Did I have this? Oh, my God. Did I lose that where I had that paper saved? I might actually have to pull this paper up again. That's why we have AI editing software, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So actually, while I pull this up, because you have a lot more, I'm sure, of the Jungian stuff. I've read a lot of Jung, but it was, you know, 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. my ability to even comprehend what I was reading was probably a lot lower back then. So... Why don't you give me, I guess, what you would consider your short summary of what the what the shadow would be in a layman's term from Jung? Um, so uh, Jung had a lot to do with like the unconscious. Like there's he's sort of like basically you can imagine basically it's sort of like a man in a small boat on top of a sea. The sea is your unconscious and the you in that little boat. That's like your your awareness to drive all of your psychology, basically. Jung viewed your unconscious or subconscious, uh, your unconscious rather, as uh, basically this undulating, roiling sea of just turmoil that was like, you kind of like, your goal is to like dig down and like pull things out of it and assimilate them into, you know, bring them onto the boat essentially and sort of make them, 
like a part of your aware, uh, your sort of like a part of your conscious life, basically. And so there, there, you know, a lot of times people view it as just like the dark part of yourself. Like what is the, your shadow? Like that's sort of like very common. Like what is the, the dark part of like, do I, I like to, I'm sort of Machiavellian and I like to manipulate my coworkers to do X, Y, and Z work for me or whatever it is. And like, they think that that's like, and then assimilating that is, is like becoming aware of those dark aspects of your psychology or whatever, and then using them for whatever hopefully uh, uh virtuous means <clears throat> and not misusing them or whatever or like um but really the shadow is like it's just sort of like uh, just sort of like blind spots it's just like any part of this un unknown unconscious part of your personality basically that just doesn't coincide with who you are uh consciously like your conscious drives motives emotions yeah, your conscious per the personality that like you you enact or you live out daily um and um yeah i mean i i think most of the times like people view the shadow as a negative thing because of the imagery that's like that surrounds it basically it just like draws up negative like feelings of negativity or whatever but those things that live in the shadow it just it just calls to the idea of things in the darkness basically like the unseen things of your personality or your psychology rather and so um yeah i think can i, 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 can I ask a clarifying question actually yeah of course yeah w would you say though that a decent part of what Jung might think of also is it Jung or junk because i've heard it so many different ways uh i think it's young like young carl young, young. okay yeah okay. yep I'm going to try to get young. So uh, would he say a lot of what makes up the shadow? It's, it's A lot of it is unseen because we don't want to look at it. Yeah. So like a lot of repressions, like it's deliberate. It's deliberately putting things in a corner, deliberately not being aware of things like, um, you know, you might distract yourselves from the way that you uh, treat your children or treat your coworkers or wh whomever in your life. So like it, it does have a lot to do with like deliberate concealment, like deliberately hiding different aspects of yourself uh, or be, uh, deliberately not being aware of them. And you could be deliberately unaware of positive things, you know, like if you have like self-esteem issues or like issues uh, with yourself uh like you just don't like yourself like like me i, I think my body is a thing for, of, for it's like worm food basically like i have a very negative view of myself my, my physicality my mind etc and so like as a result i might suppress positive aspects of my personality like deliberately i might del deliberately lean into being dumb and not using uh, the vocabulary i might otherwise use in a in a social setting because I, I just feel that i'm dumb and if i use those words or whatever um they you know they're not going to hit they're not going to land or i'm going to use them wrong or whatever that might be just like i i might know oh, that oh, i'm doing something oh, means God. i might be having a quick can, can, I hear, can you hear me yep yep i can hear you yep oh no hold on hold on mm -hmm. okay okay i think i got trying to get you through my headphones again oh uh, gotcha you hear me Okay. Okay. I got you. Um, okay. I am on my, okay. Sorry about that. Um, oh, editing software, save us. Um, yeah. You were saying, I mean, right before you cut out, you had been saying, um, you know, you look at the body is like, kind of like this warm food and you have this mm -hmm. part of what you, you might be suppressing is feelings of self-worth around that because yeah. you've got for some strange reason, you have this attachment to this negative view of yourself exactly yeah it's sort of like yeah. it's however you conceptualize yourself kind of dictates whatever you put off to the margins whatever you suppress into your sort of shadow essentially um so it's sort of like it, that that has a lot to, there's a lot of other things that you could draw into it like there's sort of like um narrativizing in psychology so like the story you tell yourself about yourself kind of dictates a lot of how you act in the world you know like if if you, if you are the hero of your story and you, you you're constantly pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or saving yourself from certain situations and standing up for yourself. And you have, you have got your, you, you view yourself confidently and you assert yourself in the world and all those things. Like you may suppress uh, your weakness. You may say, you know, I'm never, I, I, I don't cry. I'm not, you know, I don't need anybody. I don't need help or whatever. I don't uh, whatever, you know, you could insert anything in, into that um, as a, as a way to, 
uh, you know, uh, as something you suppress because the story, you, you're the hero, right? Heroes don't cry. Heroes aren't vulnerable. Heroes don't need help. All of those things regard, but in, in the reality of things, you're a human being and all human beings need help. All human beings cry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, it, it, a lot of it has to do with like how you view yourself. Uh, that'll dictate the things that get pushed off into the, the sort of shadow zone or shadow realm, basically. Okay. Well, for one, God, you got to play Spec Ops the line, man. You got to play Spec Ops the line because it's, mm -hmm. oh my God, it's literally like probably the most, from the way you're putting it, the most Jungian story I've ever seen in a game, mm -hmm. even in anything. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm, I'm going to make you play that game at some point. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. So then, here, give me a sec. I'm curious, would you like to transition into this thing that I've, this paper that I've been reading? And it's kind of, it's not just this paper, but I've been kind of just interested in this whole uh, general theory and this way of thinking about um, the self self deception and whatnot. So, do you want to transition over to that Evo psych part and see what yeah. you think? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, perfect. Give me one second. Okay, is my mic coming through a little bit better now? Yes, a lot better. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I had to go off my good mic for a second. Okay, mm -hmm. so when it comes to evolutionary psychology, a lot of the theories of evolutionary psychology that show what makes humans distinct is this idea that we're very cooperative and we're very social animals. Uh, it's not just that we're smarter than most other animals. We are. Um, they, I'm for sure basically every animal. But it's also just that we are unique in the degree that we can cooperate with one another. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I'm tracking you. Yeah. Oh, crap. Wait, why is my headphones now not working? In place. Okay, okay, now everything's good. You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Okay, next time I'm going to make sure that I keep the coffee pot near the microphone. <laughs> so, yeah, and with uh, a big part of how this works is there are different concepts. Like one of them is called reciprocal altruism. Uh, basically, it's this idea that the reason we have evolved to be nice to other people is because we expect that if I'm nice to some to person A, person A will be nice to me. And if person A decides to not be nice to me, I won't be nice to, to them anymore. And in a way, we're being altruistic. If I'm nice to him and he's nice to me, we're being altruistic to each other. But we're being altruistic to each other in a tit-for-tat game where we're kind of this is simplified, but we're kind of going back and forth doing favors for each other and being nice to each other and helping each other out. And that's why we're cooperating. I give up a little bit right now to help you because I'm expecting that if I ever need you to help me, you'll be there for me. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, yeah. Now, a big part of uh, this cooperative, uh, this very social, very cooperative dynamic is about trust, right? That's like if... If I'm the type of person where I'm like, hey, you're somebody who should cooperate with me and I'll scratch my back, you scratch, uh, or you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You need to kind of know that they're trustworthy, right? Right, of course. And well, that's where lying comes. Uh, basically, the idea here is that there is kind of an evolutionary arms race between having the ability to deceive others, which can give you... Um, you know, fitness, evolutionary fitness benefits by getting people to cooperate with you when they maybe shouldn't. So there's the ability to deceive others and then the ability to detect deception. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, yes. Yep. I'm, I'm tracking here. Yeah. So this theory is basically arguing that as part of that evolutionary arms race, we kind of developed this trump card to all of it. And it's the idea of self-deception. Uh, basically... If you are able to convince yourself that something is true, you don't need to lie anymore. And when you don't need to lie, that has a lot of benefit. For one, it's much harder to detect. Mm. Uh, if I truly believe that I'm doing something for really good altruistic purposes, when really I'm just kind of out for my own, hey, you know, if I believe it, I'm not going to give away those those telltale signs of lying. Right. Um, another one is it seems to uh, benefit in terms of just like cognitive load. Uh, have you ever... Like, we've all lied before. Have you ever known that you're lying and you're trying to keep your story straight? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely as a kid where you're like trying to make sure that you're not yep. contradicting yourself, that, you know, all the details, the timings, everything lines up. You, you know, you're trying to yeah pull all the threads together and make sure that, yeah, you don't get caught. <laughs> yeah. 
it seems like if you can actually craft a narrative that you believe with things like, you know, false memories and whatnot, or um, re reimagining your motives in a situation, stuff like that, uh, it seems to just be a lot less cognitively complex to do. Like, once you buy the story, it seems like your brain is able to flesh it out easier than if you're making something up from fiction. Mm -hmm. The last one is that it gives you a extra bit of confidence. Um, if you think that you have the better motives, if you've deceived yourself about your skills, you're going to get a boost of confidence. And there is a degree that it seems like it's better to be overconfident than underconfident. Um, this don't want to go too far with that. If you're too confident, you're going to, you know, what's the, the guy who flew into the sun? Icarus. I can't remember his name. Icarus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't want to be Icarus. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to be Icarus. But uh, if you're the guy who can convince people to help you out because you seem like you know your shit, even mm -hmm. if you maybe don't fully know your shit, mm -hmm. hey, you just got five people to help you. So mm -hmm. by being a bit too confident. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it helps. Con that confi makes, is that all kind of tracking? Yeah, I think confidence will help you sell a car, but it won't help you stitch together someone's corpus callosum in a neurosurgery context. You know what I mean? It's like, there exactly. the proof is in the pudding. When you're selling a car, it doesn't matter whether you're selling a lemon or whatever. You just have to make people believe in you and whatnot. But doing yeah. something yeah. technical, like where your skills matter more than whether you're confident about your skills or not, I'm, I, I can believe that, yeah. Yep, and I think they, the these theorists would argue that on the whole, especially, you know, 10,000 years ago when we're all living in tribes, the ability to be, be a bit more confident than you should be is going to have a, a net positive effect. Uh, even if it doesn't in the real world today, that might that doesn't change what our psychology is like from a biological evolutionary perspective. So, all right, how does this kind of incorporate into the shadow? Well, I think that, well, obviously I, I, I buy into this general theory, but two, I think that this actually is a lot more common than even a lot of people who believe in the theory might tell themselves. I do actually buy the idea that a lot of the things that people claim to believe or claim to be motivated by are basically just stories of self-deception. And the reason why they tell the stories is because it provides something uh, useful to them. It might be a lot more emotionally satisfying. It might make them feel like they're a better person. It might make it so that they are seen as more closely aligned to their group. Like, um, I can give two quick political examples. Uh, one from the left, one from the right. If that, uh, what do you think? Want to hear them? Or yeah, not? of course. Yeah. You yeah. The gist? Well, okay. might, might as well hear so, them. So someone else doesn't have the gist. Yeah. Yep. So, um, I don't know what the most recent polling is on this, but I know that it was around 60 to 70% of people who were Republicans said that they thought that Trump had stolen the election. I think that this is mostly self-deception. I think that that's probably not true at all. If, the reason why people believe it is because they tell themselves it's true because there's a lot of benefits you get from that. Uh, one, you don't have to think about the implications of your tribe uh, basically being a bunch of conspiracy theorists. That's a big part of it. Two, you get to signal your loyalty to the tribe. This is the position the tribe is supposed to take. I'm going to signal my loyalty to it. Mm. Uh, things like that, it becomes a better narrative. Like, it's a more... You don't really pay the downsides of the false belief. Whether you believe the thing or not, the world isn't going to change based off of this false belief. But you get to reap the rewards of the false belief. Right, right. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it's like it's largely nebulous. It's like it's like believing that like past Pluto, there's a big ball of ice cream or whatever. It's like it doesn't it doesn't it could be true. It doesn't matter if it is or isn't true. But like it certainly could signal to about. Uh, a small group of 100 people or whatever that that are uh, post Pluto ice creamologists that you believe in whatever they believe in or whatever, whether and it doesn't there's no there's no rent, there's no legal. It's not like you're going to get a fine or you're going to pay extra taxes or you have to do some extra thing in your daily life or, you know, there's no like, yeah, there's no repercussion. Basically, there's no consequence positive or other, well, there's only an upside, really. I mean, and then you can you can even get like more solidification from the group because you get you can attract the same haters that they have as well so like you can you can sort of develop the same yep. out group enemies as the in group has just by adopting this one belief you know so like it really does uh, what it bind and blind is the term i think where yeah basically yep. yeah yep 
And I would say it also acts as um, what I think in game theory they would call a costly signal. If mm. you take up the position that you think the election was stolen, mm-hmm. there's a large amount of the population who is either going to just outright dislike you or think you're a little bit a little bit kooky, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you're vocally proclaiming this belief, you are alienating people. So that means that if you take a position that is going to alienate people outside of your group, that's a costly sign that you are actually committed to the group. Uh, it's not cheap talk. You're actually incurring a social cost to show your group loyalty. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yep. So I would say that the other example would be for probably a lot of the pro-Palestine protests on college campuses. I'm not going to give a stance on the Israel-Palestine war. That's not for me. That's not even interesting for me to give a stance on. It's more just looking at it. I think a lot of what motivates these kids is less so this very abstract demand for justice. There are lots of worthy causes that they're completely oblivious to. They're honestly a bit oblivious to this conflict as well. But when you go out there, and this might not be everybody, but when you go out there and you're taking these radical stances and you might even get hauled away by a cop who, let's be real, you're not going to actually get charged for the crime, Mm -hmm. but you'll get hauled away to look cool um the administrators might like chastise you but let's be real you're not going to get in trouble but you get to feel like you're a hero and you're a mm-hmm. part of a group that's a bunch of heroes you mm-hmm. know the people who are on the trump side who don't have the election they get to go and they get to tell themselves i'm not saying these are equivalent either I just one way that clear but they get to you know tell themselves that they are this like righteous morally upright underdog who's fighting for truth and goodness if you're at these palestine protests and you're making a mess of shit you get to tell yourself that you're just like those student radicals from the civil rights movement. You're on the right side of history. You're going to be in the history books. You are a hero. That is why every man who goes and he gets pulled away by the cops, he is probably... Can I be R-rated on this or no? Um, sure, yeah, I think so. He, yep, he is probably deep down gritting more than he ever has in his life because when he gets pulled away by the cops and he gets thrown into a van and then uh released two hours later he is going to be able to get so much pussy that night because (laughs) oh my god look at how brave and heroic he was you know what Mm -hmm. i mean yeah it is a big it's a big signal it's like the biggest badge of honor it's like it's sort of like the it's like a blood rite or you know a a tribal ritual where the, the guy goes out and you know kills the mountain lion or whatever you know and he comes back and it's like yeah here's what i did or whatever i i am a man i am a member of the resistance or whatever i'm really bought in like i i should be i'm like i i've gained like 10 cast levels i'm no longer a serf i'm a whatever i am you know like i'm a lord or whatever it's like (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. and and especially especially for like you know and like protesting at a university level is you know that's that's what you know kids in university should do i think i mean they should be I don't, I don't know how you feel, but I, I feel like that's one thing, like that is part of the experience that like does signify to your peers. Like there are some things that are like naturally built into socializing as cause we're animals, you know what I mean? And so like, I don't know necessarily like, sig- I, I don't, I don't know actually now that I'm thinking about it, I, I was going to say, I haven't thought about it enough. I should say uh, my initial, my intuition was saying that I don't think tribal rituals are like de facto bad things. Uh, but it is interesting to view all these so- different, you know, these variety of social interactions as these sort of rituals um, for status or, or group signaling or different things like that. But but yeah, I, haven't, I think yeah, that I, oh, I, so, I was going to say, but, but even, you know, I, haven't, I haven't thought uh, thought it out completely, but that's just what my intuition is telling me off the bat. But obviously you might say something in the next 10 minutes that's going to be like, oh, actually I changed my mind. <laughs> so I would mostly agree. For me, I kind of think about these sorts of tribal rituals and stuff like that um they're tools and Mm. they can have a good use and a bad so i think that insofar as you go through a ritual to demonstrate a pro-social behavior that's probably pretty good it's like like in a way you can think of like uh when a doctor graduates med school there's a reason why we make it a big ceremony it's a demonstration of you have this good uh, skill set that society has and we are giving you status for having that skill set. We want more people who cure cancer and save kids who are dying, right? right like that's, right. that's what we want. Right. The problem I think is when people start deceiving themselves of their motivations and they're engaging in antisocial behavior under the guise and the self-deception of pro-social behavior. Does that make sense? 
Say, say again. The, I think dis, the deception my, of pros. So yeah, just say it again, so I can I can get it completely. Uh, when people have, I guess we could call anti-social motives, but they disguise them and deceive themselves into believing that they're very pro-social motives. Mm, okay. Yeah. So if you are trying to make yourself like a lot of, I think a lot of people have a lot. Like humans care way more about status than people like to admit. Uh. In a large way, because it's probably kind of low status to admit that you care about status. You're supposed to care about status, but pretend that you don't. You know what I mean? Right, right. But this is a really big part of our psychology, I think, from an evolutionary perspective, because our status within our tribe was like life or death. We survive because we cooperate. If, uh, you know, if an animal meets us in the woods and we're alone, we're probably dying. Even right. if we got the spear, this is a good shot, we're still going to die. But if I've got my five guys with me, we're good. We're solid. Status is so ingrained into our minds because we need to be a part of our tribe and we want to be able to have influence within our tribe. And we want people to give us deference within our tribe that we care. Like, it's just so much more important that we're giving ourselves credit for. And I think that with a lot of the self-deceptive behaviors, as they talk about, you're trying to deceive people, but you're also trying to do reputation management. A lot of our behaviors are just about reputation management. You want to show that you're a part of your group, you're a member of good standing, and you want to go and affirm your group's worthiness. Like you want to make yourselves look like we are, I'm a part of the right side of history. And not only that, I'm one of the examples. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I guess, I don't know if you see where this is going with this idea of the shadow, but I think feel like the way that this ties in is that there are the motives that we tell ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves for why we're doing our action. And those are often completely incorrect. And our true underlying motives are kind of underneath the surface. And we don't necessarily want to look at them because we aren't going to necessarily like what we see. And I think that this evolutionary self-deception, where it's about reputation management, self-affirmation, you know, all uh, and being able to just get away with deception. I think this fits really neatly into this idea from uh, Young of having this shadow beneath the surface. I'm not saying they're completely one to one, but it seems like this does overlap a lot with what he's trying to get at when he's making this description of the shadow. What are your What are your thoughts on that? So that that we have stories we tell ourselves that are primarily false. And that they feed into this unconscious river of just of these sort of like neglected aspects of our personality. Is that kind of the what you, you think that he would agree with that? Is that, am I understanding that right? Yeah, I feel like that fits in well. Like if I say that I'm doing something, this is like an extreme example. But if I go out and I give money to the homeless because I want to feel like a good person, but then I stream how good of a person I am and post it onto Instagram about how I'm right. giving money to the homeless. Right. Um. Your shadow in that instance is your vanity and mm -hmm. the part of yourself that you see that you're acknowledging is this nice and altruistic charitable person, but you're really just a vain person who wants others to think highly. And that's your shadow. That's your self-deception. That, or that's a part of your shadow. That's a form of self. -deception. Yeah. Yeah. What I know. Yeah. I would agree. And I think uh, Jung would likely agree as well. Like I, I'm not, obviously I'm not like an expert on him or anything, but from my understanding of his conception of the shadow, I think that these tribal rituals certainly like are like this are sort of like the collectivist way of solidifying these individual uh shadowy aspects basically like there's like the it's sort of like the social psychologist version of the shadow basically it's like a the these sort of socially reinforced narrative structures that we tell ourselves to either uh, uh, uh highlight aspects of our personality and diminish other aspects of our personality or psychology um so yeah i think that yeah i think that that that's that that tracks um, with the concept of the shadow. It's it's a it's sort of like an externalizing way to think about it. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't necessarily involve me in my head thinking about different. You know what I mean? Like suppressing or uh, are, are exemplifying different things that I think about myself. But it's also like getting uh, reinforcement from the group and then assimilating that in and learning what things I should suppress about myself and uh, uh and and highlight about myself so yeah i think that it tracks under the concept like almost one-to-one -one. okay one thing that i think is pretty interesting about this 
then is, and I, you might be able to tell me that I'm incorrect about this. I feel like psychology has generally moved away from the idea idea that there is a lot of this subconscious stuff below the surface uh that was a big part of freud and and all of the people who spun off from him uh but i feel like psychology generally doesn't think that we have all of these things going on that we aren't aware of uh if we are they're not it's not this big huge aspect of who we are mm -hmm. uh, is, would you say that's kind of generally accurate where like a mainstream psychologist might tend to argue that uh, yeah, I mean, a mainstream psychologist would probably never use the term shadow and they may not even use, I don't know, they may not even use any of the, like a lot of the language we're using is like mythological and nebulous and abstract and in sort of like woo woo and, and that kind of thing. So I think the terms that they would use now, like if you were to go see like an off the shelf therapist and they were going to do like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like what is primarily done for people, uh, CBT what a, what old standard. Yeah. It's like evidence-based therapy or whatever. And, and that's, so the, the biggest aspect of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is identifying what are called cognitive distortions, which could just be also sort of like a proxy term for, um, uh, suppressed you know, aspects of our personality or psychology, like basically the shadow, the, a distortion is, um, is sort of like an untrue way we view, uh, the world. Uh, so like, the, and it stems from like beliefs primarily. So like, I might have a belief about myself that if I were ever to, um, uh, if I were ever to get a high power job, I would become mean about money and I would become arrogant and I would become a savage because that's what my dad did whenever he, uh, he got a lot of money, he became just a horrible human being. And so I had this belief in my head. There's no, there's no real, there's no like one plus one equals two situation going on here that ipso facto means that if I get money, I am going to be like my dad. That that's like a distortion. There's no, there's no 100% corollary there's no causation there that that there's no tracking there um and so that 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 would be called like a distortion and and the result of that distortion is i suppress my ambition i don't go for promotions at my job i don't want to learn new skills because i'm afraid of making money those are all like things that you might do that you're not aware that you're not doing because of this thing you're afraid of 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 becoming essentially and so they, they would just call that a distortion and then they would track it back and like the, the, the belief is upstream from all the, from the thoughts and the actions. So the belief is that I'm going to be like my dad. If I get money, um, the thought is I shouldn't go for, uh, I, I shouldn't like learn things or try and get money or whatever. Like I, sh I you know, I just, I, I, I don't want this to be, I don't want to be mean to my wife or my children or whatever. Um, so I'm just not going to do that. And then the, the action is, um, you make 40 K a year, you, you know, live on, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, live close to the poverty line, whatever it is. Like those are like the, that's the real world implications of the down, downstream from the belief basically. But they would never say that, you know, you have, you need to assimilate your shadow. You need to assimilate the dark aspect, you know, or, you know, the negative aspects that you view about your father. Like, yeah, your dad was mean about money, but he was a success successful businessman yeah, he was a successful businessman, but he was also like abusive. And like, you kind of have to like bring all of that in and, and, and sort of like to, into your conscious awareness basically. Um, and so, but, but they would never, yeah, they would never use those terms. They would, yeah, they would, they would just call it a distortion or something to that effect. They would sterilize it basically because the shadow sounds too, yeah. too uncovered by insurance. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, which, just as a side note, maybe this will be, could have get into it probably now, but man, it is actually uh, pretty interesting when you look into the good meta-analyses comparing cognitive behavioral therapy and psychodynamic therapy, mm. with the spoiler being that for depression and anxiety, uh, they perform just about as well, yeah. uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I'm not going to say for all areas of psychology, because there's a lot of different treatments. It seems mm -hmm. like depression, anxiety, the psychodynamic stuff does do just as well as the cognitive stuff Yeah, um, in our experimental trials. Mm -hmm. so, I, mean, I, I could understand that as well, because those are like uh, diseases of despair. They're like existential in nature. It's not like, I mean, there, there, obviously there are 
chemical components or neurological components or different aspects that are physiological that are involved. But like fearing death is like, <laughs> I, I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to an evolutionary exactly. And, and there's a lot of ways to like alleviate that pressure from that fear that don't necessarily that have been done for thousands of years. I wouldn't be surprised if there were, uh, you know, alternative uh, alternative methods for alleviating that that don't involve any known therapeutic techniques, you know, psychodynamic or otherwise. I, I could believe that just because that's like endemic to human nature. Like people have feared death for since death became a thing. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, yeah. yeah. So I, I can believe I can believe that, that yeah. has a degree of self awareness. Any degree of self awareness has some fear of death. Yeah. Like like a squirrel has a fear of death. It might right. not understand it in our terms, but you. Like, trust me, if you go and your car is driving towards a squirrel, it's going to get scared, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm looking at this paper that I have. It's uh, it's a really big paper on this topic. It's called The Evolution and Psychology of Self-Deception. Uh, this is from page two. And I think this is a pretty important thing that would make this fit more within the shadow idea than fit within the traditional understanding of a cognitive distortion, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it is important to note, however, that not all biases in information processing, cognitive distortion, uh, are deceptive. For example, biases can reflect cognitive shortcuts, errors, differential weighting of prior and new information that have nothing to do with motivational concerns. Uh, for our perspective, biases in information processing that can be considered self-deceptive only when they favor welcome over unwelcome information in a manner that reflects the individual's goals. Mm -hmm. So how you're talking about these different uh, cognitive distortions that you might have that a therapist might work you through. I think the self-deception is a unique form of a cognitive distortion because it's very much a form of directional and motivation motivated. It might mm -hmm. not be uh, very well fleshed out. It might be a little bit more intuitive. But like if you're if you have this if you have this cognitive distortion that oh I'm afraid of X because of Y, it might be because there's a part of yourself that you don't want to look into, and that's what's the cause of the distortion. It's because if you really think through something, you might see a part of that self that you don't want to see. You might uncover the self-deception. And that uncovering of the self-deception is what you're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a heuristic, like if I go like like you could argue that it's kind of a cognitive distortion to say, oh, um, the doctor said X, so I'll do X. But that's it's 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 a heuristic and it's not gonna be perfect all the time, but it's not motivated reasoning. You're saying, I don't know enough about medicine, I'm outsourcing to the doctor. Right. That's the difference between um, or like, oh, I know that in April it rains a lot where I'm from. I bet it rains a lot in April when I move halfway across the world. That's right. a cognitive bias, but it's not motivated reasoning. You're just kind of economizing on thought. We'll call yeah. that. Yeah. Or they call it uh, an availability heuristic or availability bias or whatever, yeah, where it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just using the data that's available to you and extrapolating or generalizing to like everything else, like rains here, must rain everywhere, basically. Yeah, the world is too, we have to use heuristics, we have to use cognitive distortions to man manage the world because there's too much information uh, for us to process otherwise. Right. This is different because this is about your distortion is, I don't know if I'd say necessarily intentional, it's on some degree intentional because you want to avoid, you're trying to avoid things. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I think that this, would be an interesting thing to like. I'm not going to try and say that like everything that uh, Carl uh, Jung, let alone everything Freud said, is like actually it's all completely true. Right. It is all like oh my god, yeah. Like really, all we're everything we do in life is because we're really just thinking about dicks. That's mm -hmm. like like I'm not going that far down like the Freudian rabbit hole. Right. Like, I, I do think this is fairly interesting because I think this does give a good justification for going back to the older works and actually taking a lot more seriously this idea that there are unconscious things below the surface that we don't want to look at. This like just boiling under the like like I can't remember exactly how I said, but like boiling under the surface type of mm -hmm. uh, waves and currents that are going on there. I mm -hmm. think that makes sense. It does actually make sense from an evolutionary perspective to self deceive. That doesn't mean it's true, but it makes a lot of sense. And this actually seems to line up a lot more with what I would read when I was reading 
um, you know, Carl Jung and all those people than when I was reading the more cognitive behavioral stuff where they're just like, oh, you have cognitive distortions. Uh, we're just going to go and correct those cognitive distortions by showing you that they're distortions, but not necessarily focusing on the underlying motivations of the distortions. Right. Yeah. There's sort of like the, this sort of, it's not just, it's like a, the distortion itself is like a second or third order thing. And there's like these other deeper things that, that run under the surface that don't make it to the level of, you know, like the, the part about the shadow is that like, it's so, it's like you, you could like, it's, it's almost impossible to recognize the things that are in your shadow basically is like sort of how like you have to do like shadow work basically, which is just like, it takes deliberate effort and like uh, the assistance of a therapist or like some other, like, it, it's not something that you like passively do, you know, like you're not going to like stumble upon it or whatever. And like all of a sudden, like pull out all the stuff from, from like this unseen realm of like, Oh my God, like now, you know, I, I, you know, one day I didn't want to eat, eat an apple and it turns out, you know, I have this, whatever, like this deep seated, hidden, unconscious desire to kill myself through food by not eating healthy food or what, I don't know, like whatever it could be. Like, um, it, it's one of those things yeah. where it's like, yeah, it, it's like just treating a distortion sort of might gloss over that, the sort of the deeper meaning or the hidden meaning in a way. Yeah. Like, um, with the, you know, it's hard to see if, if it's correct to think to the shadow in some degree as a form of self-deception, like if, if that is, if they do map on a bit, well, one of the big problems of self-deception is it's very difficult to falsify whether or not you're still deceiving yourself about something. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's kind of like, I had a really good comparison, but it's a bit mean. I don't want to be mean. That would be, <laughs> because, because yeah, it, it, there's, it would come across as mean. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, well, like there are some times where you do wonder if you are a certain thing mm -hmm. and you just don't know whether you actually are that thing or if you're just telling yourself like am i doing this because i um am self-sacrificing mm -hmm. or am i doing this because i want to be seen as somebody self-sacrificing right right uh and there is like i'll Okay, here we go, here we go. I'll admit something uh, for me that I think is a form of self-deception that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, a part of why I think that I was wanting to go into academia was partially because I enjoyed it. Um, and I just, I, like, I do find it fun. And that's probably the reason why I left is because people there make it not fun. Right. Uh, but the another really big part is probably that I did want to have status and i did want to have money mm -hmm. uh and i didn't need necessarily to be rich but i wanted a decent living and i did want status i wanted recognition i wanted to be seen as being this like oh wow that guy really knows his stuff that's why he teaches at this really good school and he's got all these book deals and people talk to him and they listen to him and like people in power will go and ask him for his perspective on something i wanted that and I realized that there wasn't a path for me to get that with mm -hmm. the type of research that I would want to do mm -hmm. uh, and other things that I would probably get. in. I'm not going to, there are other things, but I'll get in trouble if I bring those up. So <laughs> uh, I'll just leave it at that. The status part was a big part of it. And I'm like, yeah, I can't get status there. So I'll just go get status making a shit ton of money. Fuck it. You know, that's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah. But I did tell myself that at the time, at the time I was like, oh, I'm just such a pure academically minded person. Yeah. I'm so academically minded and I'm so intellectually honest and I'm so much better than all these people that their, their awfulness makes me not want to be around them. Which right. Is so true, but that's not all. Right. True. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's similar for me. It, uh, I have like similar ambitions in that way where it's just like, I want to be, I just want to be, I just want my knowledge validated by the public. Essentially. I want people to be like, wow, like that guy has formal education. Like we can trust what he knows. We can go to him and we, we can ask him things and he knows the things, whatever he needs to know. And he has the answers of whatever, you know, the, the questions we have or whatever it is. And like, and he, and he, and he discovers things about the world we've never known. And he like draws conclusions. No one's ever thought about. And he writes things no one's ever read before. It's like, I remember <clears throat> listening to a, a lecture by the guy who started the a school of, or not, he's, he's like the current or pr previous director of the school of writing at um, 
Chicago, the University of Chicago. And uh, he was talking, he's like, you know, I was working with a student one day and and I kept asking why the student like couldn't finish his draft or whatever. And he's like, well, I just, I just want to write like Aristotle. I just want to be like Aristotle. And I just, every time I start writing, I just, you know, it's just not quite as good. And he's like, well, yeah, he's Aristotle. You can't write like Aristotle. You're a 22 year old college kid in the 21st century. You're not going to write like Aristotle. You just have to write whatever it is you need to write for the audience you're writing for. You can't, you can't, you can't, there, that's like, there's only one Aristotle. That's what we know. Everyone knows Aristotle. It's like, yeah. To think you'll be you Aristotle, be, yeah. You're not going to get the prestige. That's exactly. not the prestige that you're going to get off the bat. Right, right. It's not and a thing you can earn, that, yeah. Yeah, and I also say as a consolation, I would also say, if anything, Aristotle was in desperate need of a fucking editor, so. <laughs> yeah, lots of those guys were, it's like crazy. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I will never, I, I don't know if I could ever read Hegel because, oh my God, I've just read some passages of Hegel. And I'm yeah. like, dude, I don't give a shit if you are the best philosopher who ever lived. Yeah. I am not reading that. I yeah. ain't reading yeah. it. Yeah. You could have of the secret to immortality in your books i ain't gonna read it because death is better than how yeah to work through it. exactly yeah so, that's uh there's a one philosopher and i think he's the only philosopher that's ever understood hegel according to his own words he's he's like uh something like i think he writes something he's like it is sore in kierkegaard and he goes I think after reading under uh, after reading Hegel, I understand uh, his central premise, and and uh, and I think it's false or something like that. He like just gives like a very basic like uh, uh, like uh, re refutation to it or whatever. There's like some famous quote about, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but Soren Kierkegaard wrote like Hegel kind of. If you read like just the first page of like Fear and Trembling, he has like this like circular sentence which is just like it's impenetrable. It's like. And so many philosophers are like that. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. How, well, I guess we got on that by, uh, because I, I essentially, that that's that was part of, that's that's still probably part of my deception, or at least it was. Like, I just have that, like, I, I have like an insecurity about my knowledge, basically. And I want it validated by a formal, well-educated body of people, basically. And if it, uh, if it yeah. makes you uh, feel any better, um, th that formal, well uh, credentialed body of people, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're kind of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're kind of shit. Fair enough. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> listen, okay. Um, what was that? Um, what was it from? I think it was like the Eric and Andre show. Um, he's getting booed. He's like, I've seen what you clap for. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you boo me. Yeah, like, yeah, that's fair. That's, yeah, that, yep. But no, I still get what you mean, though, because you want, to, like, for, like, we are just really wired to care about things like status. And part of that is, like, yeah. we want to feel prestige. There's a reason why people will be brave for things that tend to bring prestige. But people usually aren't very brave if it doesn't bring prestige, you know, like, right. like nobody's going to take the brave stance that's going to make everyone look at them like they're a weirdo dork and everybody's going to be like, OK, you give me the ick now. People will take the brave stance if somebody's going to give you accolades for it. It's because we right. care about those things. And I think that's a really under pre like, I don't want to take it too far, but mm -hmm. man, I think that self-deception might be one of the most important things to help understand why a lot of the crazy shit is happening in society today. Very cliche way of putting it. Everybody thinks yeah. it's crazy. I think self-deception is a big part of it. Yeah. Well, we have more, I think the biggest thing is that we have more tools available uh, to us to enact those lo that level of self deception. Like in the past, there was like there weren't there weren't there weren't a lot of like layers to how we interact with people. You know what I mean? Like, um, like our social interactions were like very basic in the past. But now I feel as though because of the level of like the the mediums that are available to us, the social interactions like become way more complex. You know what I mean? Like in the past, like if you were a caveman and you said like. And you like insulted like a group of cave people or whatever. You weren't gonna like you weren't afraid that that like person you were talking to was gonna like secretly record you and tweet that and put it on Facebook and yeah. load it up to YouTube and have a TikTok of you doing of you talking about it and like there there's not like there were no there were there were like fewer ramifications for like negative social like attitudes and opinions and whatnot. And I think to your point, like yeah. I remember reading a paper, like we're pretty hardwired to avoid negative uh, feedback, basically. Like we definitely 
We crave like positive feedback is good, but at least not negative feedback is like is is almost just as good, basically. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, the exception. I think the exception to that is also when people feel that they have status and mm -hmm. they feel confident in themselves. Yeah, that's when people. I, I this is just I, I this was literally just a study cited in that paper that I was reading. Yeah, it, it seems to that would fit. It's like, oh, okay, well, if you're confident enough that you can handle the criticism yeah. without it destroying your reputation, right? Uh, that makes sense that you'd be more open to it. Which is funny because if you're if you are that way, there's a good shot that you're the person who needs it the least if yeah. you already are that high status. Um, this is we got. We're, we're, I know we're near the end. Yeah. One last thing I just, uh, really also would like to emphasize about this is that I think one big important element about this. And it uh, is that this is very rational. Mm -hmm. This is a form of self-deception. It's a cognitive distortion, but it is not irrational. Yeah. You do have something you're getting out of it. So when you do post what you're talking about with social media and whatnot, um, you know, it's rat. Like, not only is it rational, I'm not going to say some crazy shit in a college classroom. I know. I'm, I know better than that. I know that the Stasi is listening to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know they're there. But, um, and then what I, if like, I don't use social media, um, I won't go into why, because it's probably all self-deception, but, um, when people do post social media, it's what is social media in a lot of ways, it's a way to communicate, but it's also a form of reputation management. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a reason why every picture has to be filtered. There's a reason why you take 20 pictures and only post the best one. There's a reason why you never post about, well, some people post about their bad days, but like. That's you, also a form of status seeking. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're talking about, it's usually like, oh, wow, I had a bad day. Somebody give me affirmation or wow, everything's going really bad. Maybe I'm a righteous victim or maybe mm -hmm. everything's going really bad, but look at how much I'm turning it around. You know, mm -hmm. I've decided right. I'm not going to give, it's like, you're, it's, it's, it's very, it just comes across as so status brained mm -hmm. and it's that self-deception I feel like. Yeah. And so, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I'm glad. I'm glad that would you say that you would agree that this probably has a lot of overlap? Yeah, I would say so. I, I think so. Yeah, I think okay. it definitely. Yeah, I think it takes a slightly different angle because it, it emphasizes like social interactions as opposed to like this sort of like this individualist view of it. It's more of like a collectivist view of the shadow. Essentially, it's like it's like managing your shadow through external relations as opposed to as opposed to like a purely internal affair. So it's, it's definitely a, a different way of, of, uh, of thinking about it, but I think there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Okay. I think I could also, I'd have to, I need to go learn more about the shadow. I need to refresh. I could probably also present things that would make it fit more within that view as well, but yeah, that's probably yeah. just my, my limitation more than anything. Um, yeah. And, and, and I could, yeah. I could totally believe that as well. Yeah. I think just the, the, mo the bulk of what we talked about was like social interactions, tribal rituals, et cetera, that kind of stuff that, that uh, that enforces this, this level of self deception. Although, like the self deception itself, it, it, you know, it, it, it is it's it, it's it's uh, de facto an internal thing. Like, there's no other people implanting self deception, or it can't be purely managed by external affairs. Like, you have to do some level of 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 work on uh, like within yourself um, uh, to to maintain that level of self deception as well. So, yeah, I think that there's a lot of overlap. And yeah, I definitely could explore okay. more, obviously, but yeah. I think I have a good closing thought for me then. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, cognitive behavioral therapist blown the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, so true. Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to return to the the wizard, the the the, the age of of <clears throat> wizards and shadows and demons and subconscious, unconscious, uh, uh, dreams, all that kind of stuff. Like all that's like very interesting to me, mythologies, narratives, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I think that, I think CBT, cognitive behavioral psychologist, modern psychologist, yeah, better watch out. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I, I'll put it this way. A lot of it's probably bullshit. I, I of guarantee course, a lot of yeah. it's complete bullshit. Of course. Yeah. Rob, but there probably is something there probably is some things there that have been lost. That's, that's what I would, that's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. We've definitely, we've thrown the, we've, we've, we tried to separate the wheat from the chaff and we ended up burning the whole pile, I think. And, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, I mean, <clears throat> ideally that's what I would like to do with my work is sort of reanimate some of the old tools, the old ways of thinking and, and sort of modernize them and humanize them and make them accessible and, 
sort of bring them back into favor. That would be, yeah, that would be a dream of mine, I think. Yep, I think that'd be pretty awesome. We know that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and psychodynamic are on par with each other for depression and anxiety. So there's probably either, the, the two options are there either A, psychodynamic therapy, there's probably something there. Yeah. B, they're both bullshit and it just makes you yeah. feel better if you talk to somebody an hour a week. Yeah, yeah. Well, All cool. Right. That sounds yeah. like a wrap. I think that's a wrap. Yeah, that's All awesome. Right, man. Yeah, uh, if you want to talk tomorrow, let me know, but I know that you said you got to go. So Yeah, awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for chatting. All right, deuces.